Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All of you here and those who are joining by YouTube, the one or two that do that. What chapter are we in? 45. 45. What one? 45. Oh, I studied the wrong one again. Where did we leave off with Jacob? Where did we leave him last week? Down there, check it. How's that untoward incident with Dinah? Anybody have any further thoughts on that before we move on? Okay. The life and times of uh, Jacob. What was his last name? <laughs> oh, that's probably a very sick. The hens came home to roost. Yes, they did. And they're not they're not through gathering yet. My last note here has the brothers were treating their sister like a commodity. Pretty much. Pretty much. Chapter 35 though starts out with a cheerier note. With what? A cheerier note. Because it starts with God speaking this time. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments, and let us arise and go up to Bethel. And I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods that were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by the temple. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about him, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. I want to stop there after those verses and consider this for just a minute. He begins with God speaking and God directing. And Jacob makes preparation with his family to respond. And what is the first thing Jacob tells them to do? Get rid of the pagan legends. Yeah, get rid of the strange God. And then what? Change your garments. Change your garments. Yeah. And then what? Change your garments. Okay. Purify. Yeah. Yeah, put away the strange gods and be clean and change your garments. Mm -hmm. Garments, clothing in the Old Testament speak of habits. Of what? Habits. Oh, habits. You've heard of a riding habit? It's the way you dress when you're acting a certain way. So he asked them to put away the strange gods to be clean and to change their garments, to change the way they were acting. Well, I'm wondering I was if he's speaking a little bit to Rebecca here a little bit. Is what? To get rid of those uh, idols that she took from her dad. Hmm, I thought he didn't know about it. Maybe mm -hmm. he did. Uh, when he said, get rid of... <laughs> okay, so what does that tell you about the time of the time between the point where she steals her father's idols and now. He ignored it. Well, number one, he finds out about it. Because he knows. Yeah, yeah, he's, he doesn't he's say, gotta know. He doesn't say, if you have some, he says, get rid of them. Be clean, change your garments. garments. So Jacob has known for some time. Yeah, I think so. It doesn't say, but... It doesn't have to. No. He knows now. And it doesn't say that God said to do this. He knew. Yeah, and when he said to his household. Yeah. I mean. All right. Genesis, what is it, 18, 17, where God comes down to Abraham. Just before uh, the, the two angels go down to Sodom. And they're out there taking that short walk, and God mm -hmm. says to his friends who are with him, Shall I hold from Abraham, or shall I hide from Abraham? Eight. Yeah, let me go back and check that. I'll get the words exactly right. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? 
seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, and he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, and do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Now do we see a little contrast between Abraham and Jacob at this point, the grandson? Jacob is not commanding his house. He's let him do this. And you have to remember... Up, up to this he's point. what now? Yeah, up to this point. Oh, up, up to this point. Yeah, up to this said, point. I'm going to go, right. so go even further, yeah. But he has, he's let him do. You know he's not commanding his house in chapter 34 because he lets the sons usurp yeah. his authority in speaking to Hamer. He should yeah. never have allowed that. And look what happens. You have deceit, blasphemy, which ends in well, pretty much wholesale murder. Yeah. And then Jacob laments the fact, and he tells them, Oh, now you're going to make me stink in the nostrils of the people, and there's more of them in their army, and they'll rise up, and that'll be the end of me and my house. <clears throat> whose, fault, whose fault was that? Whose fault was that? Whose fault was what? Whose fault was that result? Oh, that they were going to rise up and... Well, that plus the fact that they've just wiped out an entire people. Right. Unlawfully and without warrant. Right. And they've blasphemed. And whose fault was that? Yeah, whose fault is that result? Um, yeah, Who's I would... in charge? Eventually, Jacob's because he allowed it. Right. Abdication of responsibility. Exactly. You know, one of the great sins of omission. He should have stepped in and should have taken yep. care of it. Exactly. But up to this point in chapter 35, there's a, there's a distinguishing characteristic of Jacob. Jacob, although God has spoken to him, God's given him his promise, God has blessed him greatly. Jacob has still got one thing in mind, and that is his flesh. His, his flesh. Oh, yeah. It's safety, it's improvement, it's betterment. And up to this point, he's done just about anything anybody could think of, you know, flim flamming and otherwise, to make that happen. But chapter 35, for all those faults, and it is his fault, yeah. and he'll pay for every bit of it, he's still God's man. He is still God's mm. man. Oh, yeah. yeah. God's not going to change his choice. He will do whatever he has to do to make this promise to Abraham be fulfilled in these children. Because the promise is really Abraham's. And he's not going to kid around with Abraham. And he's not going to shortchange the promise relative to him. And they journeyed in verse 5, and the terror of God was upon the city. So how much of a worry did Jacob really have in the long run about these people rising up against him and destroying him and his house. They're scared to death of him. Yeah, that's a... Uh... We see this one other time. When Israel approaches Jordan to go into the promised land, they are scared to death of them. And they should have been. So, this is a little hint from the author of the book of Genesis, and you can lay that off on Moses or off on God. Where should Jacob's ultimate trust have been? In the value of his good name or the God who promised him? And it would help us if we would ask ourselves that question from time to time. Let me uh, even bring that to a finer point. It would help me if I asked that question more from time to time. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. But Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, who's Rebecca? Who is Rebe Why? who's Rebecca? <laughs> that would be Rachel and Leah. This is his mother's this is his mother's nurse. Yeah. Yeah, okay. This is the one, this is the this is the nurse that was given to Rebecca when uh, you know Isaac married her. Okay. okay. 
So what do you think job one was with Rebecca? And this Ann May? I, I didn't hear the question. What do you think her job one was? Deborah? Taking care of babies. Taking care of babies. Mm -hmm. Oh. And there were two babies. There's Jacob and a twin brother. And Jacob was Rebecca's favorite. And I, Esau is Isaac's favorite. Now do we want to make a wild guess about which baby she raised? Well, she had to raise... Jacob. Jacob. Oh, yeah. And then she <clears throat> probably... And now she's come to him. He's not home yet. He's at Bethel. Yeah. She journeys up there. What do you suppose the message is she's bringing? Your brother's waiting for you. Your mother died. Oh, yeah. Your what? Your mother died. died. Okay. I was her handmaid. Yeah. I don't have a mistress anymore. I raised you. It's his responsibility yeah. to care for her. Oh, okay. So, although it's not, at this point, it is not explicit. Rebecca is dead. Okay. Not a good bit of news when you just get home. He has not seen, uh, Rebecca and, and uh, Jacob have no. not seen each other for 20 years. Not since he left. And he dies before she gets back. And her words were, well, you go off to my brother Laban. Well, just for a little while. Uh, I, you know, he saw, you know, he's up with something now, and he'll get down afterwards, he'll be fine with it. And you can come back after a little while. 20 years has passed, she's passed, they never see each other again. That's a sad note. It is very sad. But Deborah, Rebecca's nurse died, and she was buried under Bethel, under an oak, and the name of it was called Alon Bakut. That means the oak of weeping. So she's special to Jacob, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure because... His, his, his nursemaid. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> this is his nanny. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And God appeared unto Jacob again when he had come out of uh, uh, Paden Aram and blessed him. Now, if you look at just the surface of this word here, it appears that this is when he's just leaving Laban, doesn't it? That's where Laban lives, is Paden Aram. Hmm. God does not hmm. consider that Jacob has left Paden Aram until the idols have been buried, the garments have been changed, the earrings have been broken off. Oh, and by the way, if you want to talk about habits, the earrings, that the reason you told them to break them off, and they got rid of those two, those have a religious connotation. Yeah. yeah. They what? A religious connotation. Yeah. The yeah. earring that you're wearing describes the God that you're worshiping mm -hmm. without having mm -hmm. to pack the idol around. Mm -hmm. So you have the habits, which the garments represent, and you have the testimony, which the uh, earrings represent. Which, by the way, is a public testimony. That's one of the reasons you know that Jacob knows those idols are there somewhere, and the idols are the object of the yeah. movie. And so that would include the idols that Rachel. That's where it starts. Hid under the saddle, and yep, that's where it starts. Those were la those were Laban's. Laban's. And until that's left behind, he really has not left Aden Aram, and all it means. And that's the reason that God told him to get out of there. He wants that influence away from those children. And he'll do it again. Right. Only he'll, he'll wait till they're adults. But he'll move them again to get them away from the influence. That time he'll take them down to Egypt. The very place he said never go back to. That's where he'll take them. And the, the, the effect, tell me again, the effect of that. They, you said... Something will never be until those are gone. What? He's not considered to have left Aden Aram. Laban. His and heart, the influence. His heart ties? Is that long as spiritual he heart ties? Or he's still... Everything that they were supposed <clears throat> to change and everything that he buried is a heart issue. What are you clinging to here? You've got God's promise and you've yeah. got a strange God. Now, which one are you packing okay. around? Okay. Because Jacob says, oh, look what you've done. You've ruined everything for me. Now they all come and kill us. Well, not according to God's promise. Right. Now do you see the influence of those strange gods? Fear. Yeah. Yeah. For one. Right. 
and death is the other. Yeah. Fear we found that out in the garden. Yeah. Yeah. There are promises, and then there are promises. Yeah. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called anymore Jacob, but Israel shall thy name be. The nation is starting right now. God said unto him, I am God Almighty. No question now about who's talking. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac to thee will I give it. And to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So that was a physical descent. Whether it just says that God speaks, whether, whether that is a physical appearing, I'm not going to say because the Bible doesn't say. But there is an effect of God going up. There is a departure. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had talked with him. A pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel. Now, there are those who will teach, and um, understandably so, that this is actually a retelling of when Jacob raised the pillar that we saw before, because he's telling him the same thing. That this is what, Jake? What was your question? What did you say this is the same thing as? That this is the same appearance of God when Jacob raised the pillar that we read about oh, okay. before. Oh, okay, okay. Okay? Uh, and I'm saying no, because God doesn't say go back to Bethel and raise a pillar, does he? No. He says no. you go back and build an altar, and it says he did. Now we're raising a pillar. The first pillar, remember he poured the oil, and I said, what's God have the need of an oily rock? He raises this pillar, and now look what's put on it, oil and wine. Now the oil is almost all of the um, uh, fellowship offerings and praise offerings under the Mosaic law will be accompanied with oil. There is also a drink offering. I see that. Yeah, well, and in Leviticus, it's mentioned but it's never described. There are <coughs> rules about everything you do except the drink offering. This is the first time the drink offering is actually offered. Hmm. Before the law. And it's on the same stone. So you know this is not the same time. This has got one that says he appeared again. It means that this is another time. So those who teach that it is another time will teach you that this is a renewal of the covenant. And I'm saying I'm not calling it that. Because God, who is covenant, it is, is an eternal God. He doesn't age Nothing about him ages, and neither do his promises. It is so restated, you know, for the benefit of Jacob's memory and where he is in his walk, but it is not renewed. That that covenant never gets old. So just restated, not renewed. It is restated. It is ever new. Every time a new one is born in the house of Abraham, it's new to that child. But it is not renewed in the child. It is eternal. So, does that tell us a little something about the promises we hold to? I don't mean to interrupt you. The first, <clears throat> the first time he built the pillar, he put oil on it. Mm -hmm. That was not a restatement of the covenant at that time. No. This is the restatement of the covenant. Well, it's restated to him a number of times. Oh. And, but this is a restatement, but not a renewal is what I'm saying. About Correct. It, because it doesn't age. But it is restated. God says it in so many words. And the and the <clears throat> significance of the pillar. A standing stone. Yeah. Uh, it's well, if you, if you want the the, uh, uh, the Jewish tradition, which comes from these guys. Yeah. It's a memorial. To remember, right? To remember. And God will use that with them when he's when they cross Jordan. He's okay. Uh, Twelve of you take a stone. Yeah. Put them right in the middle of the river. And when your children ask you, why are these stones here? You yeah. tell them this. 
he does the same thing. He memorializes the Passover supper when he says, when your children ask this, why do we eat bitter herbs? Why do we eat unleavened bread? Those are all memorial, basically they're memorial stones. They're set in stone in the law, literally. And so when we do, when we remember the Lord's Supper, or in the Lord's Supper, we are symbolically remembering his body being broken. That's right. And remember the Lord's Supper. Yeah, yeah, shed. Tell you. Remembering there is a new covenant given to us. That's, yeah, but it's the same idea, the same concept. Yes, right? because, when he, because when he took the cup and broke the bread, he said, this is the New Testament in my blood. Mm -hmm. not, the, not, not the goats and lambs and bulls. Mine. Yeah. But the promise is the same one. <coughs> but the law could not yeah. justify. He could. Yeah. But the promise doesn't change. The promise was given to Abraham. That's right. And that never changes. <coughs> and we inherit that promise, according to Paul in uh, uh, Romans and in Galatians. So he sets up the pillar, and Jacob called on the name. Of, uh, call the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel. And they journeyed, this is verse 16, and they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, that's, that's uh, uh, Bethlehem. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. Now, who's Rachel? Jacob's wife. Which wife? Second. Favorite. Mm -hmm. Oh, favorite wife. Yes, yes. she is okay. second. Mm -hmm. yes, there's Laban's yes. influence. It's his favorite. Mm -hmm. And it's his favorite wife. This is the love of his life. Right. This is the one that he worked seven years for, and it's like he laid down for a nap for a few minutes. I like to look forward to discussing that with him someday. Anyway, mm -hmm. when it came to pass, and she was in a part of labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, that she died, that she called his name Benoni. But his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up pillar, another rock, upon her grave. This is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. Now, unto that day that's mentioned here is Moses' day. They're on the Exodus, on their way to the Promised Land, where this pillar stands. There are only two places, uh, when he sends the spies in, the 12 spies, to the spy out the land, there's only two places they would have recognized by hearing the stories. One is Abraham's tomb. The other one is Rachel's pillar. They don't know any part of the rest of that country. But they know those two places. So we know they got at least as far, the spies, at least as far north as Bethlehem, the city of David where Christ would be born. And that's what they walked back from and said, can't do it. So when you look at these old dust-covered verses in Genesis, watch where they're leading you. Mm -hmm. And we keep saying, well, it points everything to the New Testament. The New Testament is us. If we see a fault in Abraham, guess where God is showing us the fault really lies? Yes, now Abraham and, and Isaac and, um, and Abraham, well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in a way, they're not like we are. Do you ever eat a meal with God sitting there? Do hmm. oh, yeah. you ever see a ladder going up to heaven with the angels going up and down and God at the top of it? Do you ever wrestle physically with God himself and survive or expect to? These guys did that. But if you look at their stories, and that's one thing I'll, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll give God all the credit. He's a very honest biographer. We see these guys warts and all, and it's mostly warts. Which tells me, if they're like us, the New Testament people, they are a people in need of a redeemer. Same as we are. And we see all their faults. And for all of that, God comes down and he says, I'll get back to Bethel, go and all. They have one of them. And so do we. The promise doesn't age. It doesn't get, it's not renewed, it is restated. Every time the gospel's preached, what you're hearing is the Abrahamic covenant being fulfilled or, the, or being offered to be fulfilled in you. That's the gospel. 
purchased by the blood of Christ, but that's the gospel you get. And Israel journeyed. Ooh, what did God just call Jacob? <laughs> and Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. Oh dear. Mm -hmm. Does this remind us of chapter 34 a little mm -hmm. bit? Mm -hmm. um, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. Now we know it's 12 because Benjamin's just been born. Just a baby. That's the 12th son. Mm -hmm. It's also the last son. Uh, Jacob will never marry again. But look what Reuben just did. What? Look what Reuben just did. Well, he lost his birthright. I do know that. Well, he has committed what? Well, no, it isn't. Incest yeah. and treason. Well, it would be incest. Well, yeah. Who else is mentioned in Scripture that does this? Lays with his father's concubine. Yeah. Oh, come on, you're not that Lays biblically illiterate. Concubine. I know you better than that. Now think, think, think. Of course, when I ask a question, it drives the answer right out of your mind. Same thing's happened to me, so don't mind my berating. Okay. okay. Uh, Absalom. Huh? Absalom. When he comes into Jerusalem, he lays with David's concubines, so and when David comes back and retakes the throne, he sets those concubines aside. What that is, it is a, and he took, and he spread the tents, remember, on the roof, so all Jerusalem could see this happening, know what's going on. By taking uh, the king's concubines, you are taking authority over his entire household, and David was not dead. That's treason. Mm -hmm. Now, this is no less a crime. And what does it say that Jacob did about it? Right there. But it tells us very plainly that he heard it. Oh yeah, he knew it. He knew it. Now, rightfully and righteously, what he should have done is he should have dealt with it right then. And she should have been set apart from uh, from that point on from, from Jacob's household. He did not do that. Mm -hmm. Now you'll have the restatement of uh, all the son's names. Mm -hmm. And it says that Jacob came unto Isaac his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, which Abraham and Isaac, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And the days of Isaac were 104 score years. So that's how many years in metric? 180 years. Okay, 180 years old. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died, and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Now, I don't know what to do in terms of next week and <coughs> chapter 36, so I'm going to give you some homework, all right? <laughs> Rather than teach the genealogies, I'll simply ask you to read them through the week, chapter 35. Yeah. We'll take up the, or chapter 36. We'll take up the study in 37. But you'll notice whose genealogy this is. Yeah, Esau's. This is Esau's. These are the people who populate around the Holy Land, largely on the east side of uh, Jordan and the, uh, and the Dead Sea, and they become... Edomites. Well, they, they, become, they, they are Edomites. They become Moab and uh, Ammon and all the rest of these countries out here that are going to be some friendly, some not so friendly, uh, and all of them are going to be subsumed into the Solomonic Empire. But what is what the Bible is telling you and showing you where all these come from. And it's still, no matter how big a nation they become, it's still a family affair. Because Israel is still a family. God deals with them that way. God deals with them that way. Now let's back up just a little bit. We saw the issue with Dinah. We saw where Jacob did not assert patriarchal authority, let the sons kind of, and we had murder that was the result. And it's the first time, I believe, that you have what we would consider, uh, you know, um, a smudge 
on the name Hebrew in the Holy Land. Nobody has anything against them until that point. Now, Jacob's telling the truth. You, you're going to make my name stink in their nostrils. And it did. Up until that point, that was never true. Anybody wanted the blessing, anybody wanted to walk on the sunny side of the street, they got as close to Abraham and Isaac as they could get. Mm -hmm. Now look at the difference. They're scared to death of them. They don't want them anywhere around them. That will never change. Now it's said that God put the terror on them, and there's a reason for that terror. As much as he wants those 12 boys, now you know, all 12 boys, now counting Benjamin, out of the influence of Laban, Hayden Aram, and um, the idolatry that's there, he wants them also not influenced by the people where he's bringing them. And that's why after we get these very complex genealogies in, uh, in chapter 36, the focus is going to change real quick to Joseph, no longer to Jacob. Mm -hmm. Because Joseph is the one who's responsible for bringing all this back. Now, Jacob doesn't lose the promise. Jacob does not lose the blessing. He doesn't lose the choice he got. <coughs> and from this point on, as we see, um, you'll see more and more of Joseph and his brothers. You'll see less and less of Jacob. But as we see Jacob, when we do going ahead, I would simply suggest that you notice the growth that has been in that man's life from this point in chapter 35. Everything up to that point has been his fault because he's been walking in the strength of his flesh. Yes, he knows about God to begin with as the unconverted believer. Yes, he knows God personally. He sets up the stone, puts the oil on it. Now he's not only set up building the altar, he's setting up stones, and he's calling upon the name of the Lord. And what is that? Preaching. Calling upon the name of the Lord is public preaching in Old Testament terms. We saw how that began after they left the garden. They, there was a God they knew. As generations move along, then it's the God they know about. And at that point, they call upon the name of the Lord. Now, Jacob is at the turning point in his life where this is happening. God still descended and spoke to him directly, verbally. Restates the covenant and says, it's, I will fulfill it in yours and in your children. Now, here's the interesting part. This is at Bethel, right? Where he does this. And this is where Jacob swore the vow and said, you know, if everything you said you do, and if you give me bread, and if you give me, you know, a, a raiment to wear, and if you bring me back here safely, if, 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 uh, I'll give you a chance of everything I have. Oh, yeah. You know, he's going he's to give him... Uh, you know, the respect of worship. If, 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 if. Now, if you look in chapter 35 where God comes down to Jacob, how many ifs do you see in that statement of his? If you, if you, no. There's no if. I will, I will, I will. And that's, and it's, and that will, we see is always something that's going to happen in the future. In Hebrew, it, that verb tense starts in the past, it continues into the present, and will go into the future. I will continue to. I'm broken. Okay. Jan, yeah, a question. Hmm? Why, uh, why did God change Jacob's name? He had to. Once Jacob again, means, why did he, he had change to. it? Jacob means the planter. So you mean it means he has to promise, or he's taken the promise by unlawful means. So, in other words, that's why he's changing it. I mean, the prince who prevails with God, he wrestled with God all night long, won and lost at the same time. So, what does Israel mean? Prince who prevails with God. Okay, prince who prevails with have God. You, have you done that? Jacob's I will not plan. let you go until you bless me. That was the win. That was the receiving of the blessing. Jacob was surplanted. He lost because the angel didn't walk away crippled, did he? And Jacob Israel did. was... Prince who prevails with God. Jacob means trickster, supplanter. 
and he was Jacob up until he finally gets a hold of something real. It's grasping. He hung on all night long. The same as he was hanging on to that, his brother's heel when he was born. But this time it was offered. God came and offered it. Yeah, and he so wasn't going to let go until he had the blessing from the one who had the right to give the blessing. It's no longer a stolen blessing. It's no longer a stolen birthright. Esau loses the birthright by marrying the Canaanite yeah, and yeah. the Ishmaelite women. Yeah, and he knew that. They all know it. But they didn't know it at the time that he's selling soup and skinning goats and putting them on his hands. Even he did not know it. He thought he was going to get it that way. He was trusting to his flesh. Rebecca was trusting to the flesh. And the confederacy of that kind of trust ends in death. And Rebecca dies. They never see each other. I know. In the oh, meantime, sad. remember, he says, shall I hide from Abraham? Because I know he will command his house. And Abraham commands his house, and he says to his steward, don't you dare take my son back to... Yeah. It's the same place where, uh, where Jacob goes. Yeah. Isaac does not say that. Isaac says to Rebekah, hmm. yeah, well, there's certainly no love lost between these boys. Maybe he better go back to our kindred and get a wife. That's not well ordering and commanding the household, is it? Abraham commands the steward, you go, you find her, you bring her here. So you're saying Isaac was the instigator to send I'm saying uh, that Jacob away? Yes. I thought of, I, I always thought it was Jacob, Rebecca. Oh, Rebecca, put, Rebecca is the, like the, the flea in his ear with the idea. Okay. But, and then as he's leaving, Isaac <coughs> blesses Jacob for that journey. Esau sees it, and that's when Esau realizes, my father's not pleased that I married Canaanite. This is a very knowledgeable family. But Jacob, J uh, Jacob, Isaac, who knew his father a long, long time, Isaac, who knew how his wife was brought to him and where he was when she came, knows how to do this correctly. It's the patriarch's responsibility to arrange the marriage. It's not the patriarch's position to tell the son, well, you go off and do the best you can. That's what happens to servants and slaves. That's not what happens to the children of the household. Abraham commanded his family. Isaac does not. And Jacob learned that does not part really well because he doesn't need her. Yeah, <coughs> he's exactly. not sending those sons anywhere, but he lets them run them off right there in his presence. When they're talking to Hamer, um, a, a man who had commanded his family and kept it well ordered, that would have never happened with Bill Buck. And it says he heard it and did nothing. Now, it doesn't mean he forgets. But he did nothing. Now, whether it's because, and you have to remember, Bilhah is whose handmaid? Uh, Rebecca's. Rebecca's? No. No, Leah. No, it's Leah. Leah's, Leah's. Leah's. Because Ruth, now, yeah. Yeah, now, well, excuse me, Rachel's. Yes. <laughs> is, there, is it Rachel's? Yes. Let me look. Okay. It's Rachel and Leah, not Rebecca and Leah, but I believe it's Leah's handmaid, isn't Bill? Huh? That's what I thought, but maybe okay. not. Maybe not. Maybe He's looking. Not. The pastor's looking. He's after finding it. He's looking in his notes. It should be right Rachel's. Here. It's Rachel's. It says okay. the sons of so yeah, the Rachel's handmaid. The concubine of the favorite wife. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And Reuben is who? It's Leah's. First, the first son of Leah's, but it's also Jacob's firstborn. Right. So what has he just done with the birthright? Threw it away. When will that get fixed? When will that get fixed? Yeah. Fixed. He's lost. It's not fixed the way anybody else thinks it's going to get fixed. It's fixed when. Um, <coughs> Jacob, in Egypt, when he's dying, blesses Joseph and right. grandchildren and adopts the two boys as his firstborn. Right, right. Because, right. I mean, it, it never gets back to Reuben. He's no. lost it. No, it's, he's lost it. Yeah. Esau never got it back. No, no, no. You don't get it back. 
Reuben isn't going to get it back. Absalom never had it. No. No. But that's the fact. And here's one of the things I want to point out about chapter 35. And, well, even those that 33 and 34 coming up to it. All these lapses, we call them stumbles, and they are. And we can see that happening in our own life. The sad part of it is, is that for the longest time, they think they're getting away with it. No. They think they're getting by with it. Um, God's already told uh, Jacob, uh, you know, don't worry what Laban's going to do. Uh, you know, let me show you a vision. So he shows him the flocks, you know, at the troughs. And what does Jacob do? He goes down and he's peeling rods and he's shaking them around. And whether he's doing that to, to flim flam the brothers and give them something to look at, it's a little hard to say. Could be both. I don't know. But that was him trusting to the flesh. And he's had the promise. He doesn't have to make a big deal out of it. But he does and he thinks he's going to get by with it. And it looks how he leaves Laban's household on a dead run. Which is the same way he left home in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because he thought he was getting by with it. He fooled Isaac. Did he get by with it? No, he got out of there with it. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't get to see his mother again. So I have a a question about that. Then you probably should spend some time in the deep. Space. I should. Yeah. But in verse twenty nine, Isaac dies. Does he? In chapter thirty five. How many times? Mm -hmm. But this whole big mess started with. Oh, my father's about to die. I better go in and get the blessing and dress up in hairy things and cook a meal. And, and he didn't die right away. He didn't die for a while away. Yeah. So what's your question? Yeah. He, what, what's that all kind about? Of a, kind of a lame excuse. Kind of a lame excuse. <laughs> and Isaac doing it. It's okay, so he's blind. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, but he's not, or has, has he been a... Uh, the crypt keeper for the last 20, and they just like haul him from place to place. And I mean, he's I mean, been what? that sick for two decades. No, here's the deal as I see it it said that he was blind, yeah, right. That's why you can't tell, that's why they put the ghost kids on there. Now, this is this is Rebecca and this is Jacob walking by sight because he's no he's no spring chicken now he's not on his last right, leg right. he's no spring chicken but they see him lose his sight oh the rest is going to go anytime oh. and there's god who will allow many things but will eventually overrule everything so you want to bet Let's not forget, Isaac is the child of promise. He's got his choice too. And he's not going to shortchange him because he's Abraham's son. Right. No, they got the cart before the horse by thinking well, he's, he's on his last legs. He wasn't. So why does Isaac do it? Do what? It, bless him if he knows that he's not dying. I mean, okay, kids, I guess you want me to do this, so I'm going to do it. I'm not dead. No, 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 no. The idea starts with Isaac. He calls, he calls Esau, and yeah, he says, hey, not why. Jacob. He calls Esau, and he says, hey, you know, I'm old, you know, I'm blind as a bat. I don't know the day of my death. Now, why don't I just go ahead and give you an odd way we'll make sure you get it? Because God knows what the problem is. Isaac knows that Jim, that got to get the names right. Isaac knows that Rebecca <laughs> has been told that the older will serve the younger and the older is Isaac's pet. Well, it's his blessing he thinks to give to. That is a mistake that Abraham would have never made. So that gives us a clue to Isaac, the do-nothing guy, that maybe he is just, <laughs> like, just like his son. Son yeah. Jacob. Filthy stinking rich. Filthy stinking rich and, and trying to yeah. do a little tricksy do. Well, it wasn't the first time he tried a little tricks he do. He tried it down in Gerard. Right. So he, other words, he, got he caught, and he was caught there too. In yeah. Other words, he thought he'd bless Esau and absorb the idea that the younger would serve the older. Interesting. If he could get and that this, blessing and when, the he Esau, and when he does the blessing himself to the grandsons, he surprises. Not only himself, but also Joseph, because 
Joseph presents the two children and Jacob crosses his hands. And Joseph says, no, 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 this is the oldest one. Yeah, but he did. He says, I know. And, and basically, he oh, boy, do I know. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's where it and it's And it's right in Jacob's face. The irony is inescapable. Now, the sovereignty of God is just as inescapable when you see that happening. Okay. But now, interesting, this, interesting. This, as you read through this week, uh, chapter uh, 36, I just want to point this out to you. Of course, these are this is a genealogy that will come from Esau. And it delineates his wives and who the sons and everything are. But I want you to notice that it begins with... Uh, they take the title of dukes. Of what? Duke. Mm -hmm. And then uh, these were the dukes of the sons of Esau. That is in verse 15. And then they become kings. Mm. And, and they're all, they all have titles. If they're sons of Esau. Now, Genesis is the book of one beginning and many firsts. And this is the first. And that is the title of nobility in the Holy Land. Now I know that we're talking about Edom here, but I'm sorry, that's part of the promised land. From the seed of the Euphrates mm -hmm. and everything in between that part of it. So. That is the rise of nobility. And the other thing a little trick I want you to notice is Moses puts a little scribal note in there and it says these before there were any kings in Israel, these people were kings. Now, I want you to think about that for just a minute. What, what's just happened in that statement? On verse 31, are you looking at Yes. Yeah. 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 And these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before there reigned any king over the children of Israel. Now, this, remember the one we had the two words up here? Exegesis and eisegesis. Mm -hmm. Do a little exegesis here. Before there were any kings mm -hmm. who reigned over Israel. Well, who wrote Genesis? Moses. Moses. Were there any kings in Moses' no. time? No, not What did he just tell them? This man's a prophet. Let's not forget that. There will be. So he, he's, he's, that's a prophecy that now, just 31. Just sneaked in there in this little short little sentence. So 31 Before is there a prophecy. were any in Israel. And it's, that's 450 years after this is going on. And it's, a, it's a, what is it? I forget what the time frame is between the conquering of the Holy Land and the establishment of Saul. But it's a long time to the time of the judges. Moses already knows it's coming to that. Moses already what? Moses already knows. It's coming to a king. Now, he's also writing the book of Genesis. I want to go back. Remember when I drew the overarching arches and say how this was written? Now, I want to stop back for just a minute. And it's, if you, and it's, it's going to be, we haven't read it yet, but we will before we get to the end of Genesis. It recalls all the things that each each one of them a blessing. What? He gives each one of them a blessing. Each one of the 12 boys calls them all in. Right. Right. What does he say about Judah? Oh, he is. It's going to be the, yeah. He's going to be the, the scepter big guy. will not depart. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, that means only kings hold scepters. There's, there's a king coming. Now, we know that, he, that that prophecy extends all the way to Christ. And we also know that in the Abrahamic covenant, it has two aspects, physical and spiritual. Now, they're both true in Christ. It's physically true with David from that, from that house of Judah. But now I want to show you the exquisite accuracy of a prophet. It says the scepter will not depart from Judah, right? It's restricted to Judah. Who was the first king? What was his tribe? What was his what? What was his tribe? Benjamin. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness, the scripture just fell apart right in front of us, didn't it? That's Isis, Jesus. Let's do a little exegesis. 
Jacob doesn't tell his sons that it will start with Judah. He tells them once they have it, it will not depart from Judah. Oh, okay. And it, it's all right there. And if and as we take that and we look at the history, we see exactly that's how it works out. See that minimal understatement that is so accurate. If you can take a prophecy, any prophecy given in Genesis or any part of this Old Testament, that doesn't manifest with that accuracy in the New Testament, we're probably reading it wrong. Now, I didn't take this time this morning just to pull out a couple of trivia accuracy to show you this. I guess maybe I'm burying my soul a little bit. I'm opening a little window to you about how I study. I got it. The first thing is, if it says it, believe it. That's a good rule of thumb. If the Bible says it, believe it. If you have a problem with consistency, the problem is with me. Understanding. Not with this. And, it's, and the problem usually starts because I've approached this inconsistency that I have stumbled across with a preconception. So my advice as you study is to read it as if it is being read for the first time. Read Daniel and Lion's Den. We've all heard that story since we were, you know, in the cradle. Okay, read it for the first time. We all know about the crossing of the Red Sea. We all know about the Man of Heaven. Read it as if you're reading it for the first time, word for word. And here's the second half of that bit of advice. Read it as if it was written for nobody's benefit but yours. Mm. The reason that God is so honest about all these flaws, the pockmarks, the warts, in Jacob, in Isaac, and even in Abraham, it's not going to help them. They're dead. It's written for our example, our loving. It's written for us, both to see, to recognize, to confess, or to avoid. That's what this Old Testament is for. So when everybody stands up there and tells you, well, <laughs> we're all under grace. You don't have to worry about the law in the Old Testament. Fully. The New Covenant grows out of the Old. And it doesn't grow out of the Mosaic Covenant. It's Abrahamic. Because that never stops. And we see that in the law of all these failing men and everything we do. Jacob's doing nothing about Reuben. Jacob's doing nothing about this issue of Dinah until everything blows up in his face. But he's trusting eventually to the one who can take care of it. Work it out and bring good from it. And eventually he will. Because once the name is changed from Jacob to Israel, he's not just God is not just dealing with Jacob. He's dealing with those 12 boys in Jacob. And you watch as we go on, Jacob will now begin to assert patriarchal authority because that is an attribute of the God that he's trusting. He's built the altar, he's raising the memorial, and he's beginning to preach, finally, his own testimony. The God who was with me in my distress. Up until then, it's the God of Abraham, it's the God of Isaac, and it's the God of No, now it's his God. That's growth big time. Chapter 35 uh, is the turning point. What a nice Now, he doesn't, you know, it doesn't turn night into day, but it lights the night light where he's heading, he's heading that way. By the time the boys go off to Egypt, he will have pretty well arrived. Questions? Comments of your own, thoughts of your own as you would study this. You don't have to listen, just listen to mine. You can give voice to your own. But we don't have time for it, but Jacob or Jacob calls his last son Benjamin. Right. Strength of my right hand. Mm -hmm. Is that what that means? Mm -hmm. well, what you know what the euphemism is? Yeah, that's He's, what he's, he is, it's a statement he's stating uh, publicly by giving that name that he's old. Uh, and the son of my right hand is the one who's going to stay with me that I can lean on in my old age. And let's not forget Jacob's trip. That's been since the first time there. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Rick, while you're up, would you close the prayer? Sure. Please?